candidate is seeking a second term in office, that he was raised in Long Lake, Minnesota. He graduated cum laude from Yale University, where he played Division I hockey. And after college, Mark taught ninth grade general science for two years at a New York City public school before he returned to Minnesota. Governor Dayton has spent the most of the past 37 years in public service as commissioner of the Minnesota <coughs> Department of Economic Development and of Economic Development and Energy as state auditor, as United States Senator, and as governor. Governor Dayton has two grown sons, Eric, grown sons, Eric and Andrew, and one grandchild, and he lives in St. Paul with his two German shepherds, Itasca and Juan Miguel. Please help me welcome. Listed my, my previous occupation, but it took a four year old girl and an early childhood program in Rochester to sort of really capture the essence of, of what I do. And she looked me through up and down and she said, Are you, are you the bus driver? <laughs> 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 I'm in way, you know, I'm sort of driving the bus. Drive the bus. bus. The <laughs> the <laughs> the <laughs> the 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 oil wasn't really necessary, but uh, anyway, I appreciate the chance to appear before you today and I remember doing so four years ago and I recall saying then that uh, I promised a new and better relationship between county governments and the state of Minnesota and one that was based on mutual respect, uh, one that understood the need for cooperation and collaboration. I don't think we've achieved that in any perfect sense but I believe that it's better than it was before. I also assured you then that I would not attempt to scapegoat counties or <coughs> other local governments for property tax increases caused primarily by the cutbacks of state funds. And I kept that promise. I know from being the state auditor of Minnesota and auditing county books as well as other local governments that counties operate on very tight budgets and your expenditures are very carefully scrutinized and controlled and you're constantly trying to meet the expanding needs of your constituents uh, within those organizations. Since uh, then, in the last three and a half years, we've encountered new challenges and new, new problems. I acknowledge that we haven't uh, always made your lives easier. We haven't always made our own lives easier. But I believe we have improved the adequacy of services that you deliver and the state delivers for an increasing number of people who need those services. Along that line, I want to thank you for your tremendous assistance that you and your county staff have provided to venture. And I want to apologize for the excessive burdens that is placed upon you, your budgets, and your people. The problems that have afflicted the inception of venture are, are my biggest disappointment in my term as governor. It's gotten better, and it will continue to get better, but it still has a ways to go, and it's been difficult for you and for your staffs. I appreciate that and thank you for that. You know, there's some people who oppose the Federal Affordable Care Act, which mandates healthy changes, or the state either its own or the federal or everyone else. The people that have opposed the act and what its changes it's made have cheered and <coughs> <coughs> struggles and still hope for its demise. Even though they offer nothing better, only a return to the previous failures that caused it to be devised in the first place. You and your staff, by contrast, have mostly done your utmost to help ensure overcome its early deficiencies and to make real progress. Over 300,000 Minnesotans have now obtained their health care coverage through MNCAP, MNCAP, MNCAP. For many of them, the Affordable Care Act made it possible to acquire coverage that they've been denied before because of pre-existing conditions. Others now have better coverage at lower cost. One gentleman told me last week at the state fair that, quote, Minsure saved my life and my wife's life. We get covered now with things that we couldn't be had before and saved us over $10,000 a year in premiums and co-pays, That's the untold story of Minsure. 
It will gradually become known, along with the dramatic drop in the number of Minnesotans who are uninsured. And again, that's great credit to you and to your operations. At the core of your know, state and local government partnership is, is funding. Fiscal conditions of counties and other local governments are inextricably tied to state governments. To pretend as was the fashion in St. Paul before our arrived and still lingers a bit today, the county boards, mayors, city councils, school boards, and township officials are separately responsible for their taxing and spending levels is utter nonsense. The state sets the rules, which dictate how local governments can raise their revenues, and even how much they can raise. It also decides the amount of state revenues it will share with local governments. Those two sets of decisions are at the core of the state-county relationships. And to pretend that other things are central, they are, but not to that extent uh, that those two get decisions. How to permit you to raise the revenue you need to operate and how much assistance to provide from the state to share of uh, revenues are the crux of a successful or a less than successful state local government relationship. In the last four years, especially the last two years, we've reversed the decline in state financial aid to local governments, which led to cutbacks in many essential services and the annual property tax increases over 6% in the decade before it took office. County program aid has increased from $165 million in 2010 to $206 million in 2014. Changing land values, which have negatively impacted some counties, the CPA were corrected last year by the, for this year by the 2014 legislature. And if I'm governor next year, I can guarantee you that a similar full of harmless patch will be enacted next year for those counties that stand to lose CPA under the current formula. The property tax is halfway. It's been around as long as the state of Minnesota. And like, a, like an old car, uh, it shows its age. You know, it's, uh, it needs uh, almost continuous fine tuning and, and retooling in order to continue to function properly. But no one's devised a better model. And until they do or we do, uh, we're going to need to just can be, commit ourselves to making the current one work as well as possible on an ongoing basis. Counties also benefited from the sales tax exemption passed in 2013. That exemption is worth about $70 million in, in, uh, in expenditures that you don't have to pay. In the current biennium, over $100 million for the next biennium. The 2014 legislative succession expanded further that sales tax exemption to joint powers and all other local government entities. Also provided in 2014, $4.5 million and for this year and $10 million per year after for counties who <coughs> work on combating the aquatic invasive species in partnership with the state initiatives. Uh, $33 million in bonding for local bridges, $54 million in bonding for local roads, $2 million for voucher, wetland replacement. And the 2014 supplemental budget included $20 million to start a new broadband infrastructure grant program, as I gather you just were discussing, which is crucial to all of Minnesota, but especially those areas that are now unserved or underserved. And as you know, counties will be eligible to apply for those funds along with others. And I see this as the beginning. It proves, as I expect, it will be an effective program. And the, this is just the beginning of the partnership that we will build uh, to make broadband available uh, everywhere in the state to everyone. County veteran service officers funding is near and dear to my heart because when I was state auditor, we conducted the study, <coughs> which led to the uh, first funds, state funds provided for the CDSOs. And so I'm well aware of the really the crucial work that they perform and that those responsibilities are even greater now with the returning uh, veterans from Iraq and from Afghanistan. So when I appeared uh, four years ago, that, that state funding had been disbanded, which we changed, and 
2013 legislative session provided another two million dollars in funding for those offices around the state, and uh, they need more, and we should provide. Them. Last spring, I, I signed into law a new state disaster assistance program. The legislature deserves the credit; they initiated it. Um, the program is going to provide state funding for counties that uh, do not meet the threshold requirements on the FEMA for for uh, disaster aid. And we'll see a uh, short order when we finalize the, the numbers with FEMA. But it would appear that uh, this program, the state program, which has a lower threshold, will be vital for Dakota County and Morrison County and fall line for that um, help with uh, their reconstruction. The main area that uh, I think we have not dealt with properly and, and we'll have to next year whether I'm government, governor or not, as I, I keep saying this time next year I'll either be in Bemidji or Bolivia. And, uh, <laughs> Oh, if that's in Bolivia, I'll send, send you an email. Bemidji <laughs> <laughs> uh, and thereabouts, uh, and even if I'm not, in the next legislative session, I hear from uh, all accounts, one of the principal focuses will be on transportation. Uh, we have been inadequately funding our uh, all of our infrastructure improvements, food and water, and airports, and other infrastructure, but transportation is the most visible to our citizens on a daily basis, and somebody who drives all over the state has been for the last uh, almost 40 years. I said when I first ran in and served back in the late 70s, early 80s, I could uh, leave one town and write thank you notes uh, to, uh, on the way to the next town. I, I wasn't driving for you, but... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now I, I literally can't keep my, my fingers on the laptop in order to, to do anything. So the deterioration in the quality and the capacity of our front highway system is, uh, you know, you have to have lived it over the course of time to appreciate, as I'm sure most of you do, how, just how much it's deteriorated over, the, over that period of time. And MnDOT says, uh, you know, we asked them to look at the, the set of task force uh, that you participated in, and they produced a year ago an analysis of the needs and said that if we keep spending at the level of the current expected revenues from state, and federal, and other sources, the quality is going to continue to deteriorate, the capacity is going to continue to become more and more insufficient. It would take, they estimated, $6 billion over the next 10 years of additional revenues in order to keep things basically where they are now same level of quality and capacity. And if we want to improve our system, it's going to take more than that. Obviously, that money doesn't come from behind. It also doesn't come from, uh, quote unquote, restructuring the Department of Transportation and getting efficiencies that are going to generate $6 billion. And that's just fanciful. If we wanted to increase our expenditures for roads, highways, bridges, we're going to have to face that. And we're going to ask the people of Minnesota. What, what do you want? What are you willing to support? The legacy men show that people are willing to reach into their pocket and contribute something that they believe is important and that they believe will occur as a result of, of that commitment. That's what we're trying to do with the corridors of commerce now is identify some several ready projects of like Highway 14 and Highway 94 heading to St. Cloud, 610 and others, 23. Uh, they're ready to go or near ready to go so we can show people if you make this increased investment, this is the kind of result you're going to get. And uh, this is the, these are the kind of improvements that you will see as a result. And my hope is that that will persuade the majority of Minnesota citizens as well as legislators of the, the imperative need to address the transportation funding in the next uh, legislative session. Because it's going, to, it's, it's going to take all of us, it's going to take uh, your support, and uh, it's going to take your business support, Consumer can support, truckers support. It's going to take everybody understanding what the consequences are of doing nothing, as well as what it takes to do something that's meaningful and worthwhile. Finally, I just close by saying, you know, the best thing that the state of Minnesota can do for county, and for cities, and for townships and schools is to have a good fiscal condition for the state. And I'm, I'm very proud of what we've achieved. 
coming into office with a six billion dollar projected budget deficit. Now we're looking at forecasts of surpluses. Uh, we've been one of the states leading the national economic recovery, so part of that gain has certainly been because of national improvements, but we're also one of the leading states in terms of increased employment and uh, standard of living. We have 150,000 more jobs in Minnesota than we did when I took office. That means we have a lot more people paying into revenues for the state and for counties and for other public purposes. We got a long ways to go. We're not by any means uh, satisfied. We know that we have more, great more jobs. We know that what we've seen in the progress of all of the state now in job creation is, is the beginning of what needs to be a sustained and successful effort for the next next years. And we're committed to, to carry that out and working with you to more effectively serve the needs of people throughout the state so we can be a more attractive place for people to locate, visit families, and, and uh, locate and raise the expand the business. So that I'll, I'll pause, that's 15 minutes. And, Julie's got the promise me she'd take just the easy questions. And I get to decide if somebody is easy or not. And, and if you that, that's the way it works. Is that right? Yeah. See, now I have to try and please both uh, the governor and my members. <laughs> <laughs> of course, Monty has a hard question. So we'll, we'll try and watch that. I went over to Chris, Chris Mondo in the Senate and said, I've known a lot of stupid politicians, but I never knew one who couldn't count. <laughs> <laughs> so when you can count the number of people on one side and the other side, I think I know where I stand. Well, we'll do our best. So the first question is one that I just got handed. Thank you. Um, and this questioner asks, for years, the Minnesota legislature has put politics before policy. As governor, what would you do to overcome this to bring forth meaningful legislation if given a second term? Really? <laughs> I mean, I don't know how you separate them out, and part of that's in the eye of the beholder. Uh, I will say that, you know, 2011-12, the big adjustment for me, coming from the United States Senate, coming from serving in the state government uh, three previous times, was the division and the cementing of positions and the willingness to reach an accommodation that was necessary to keep the state operating during July of 2011, as well as to resolve some matters. And there are instances where we did, for example, reducing the timeline for uh, environmental permitting and review process, which is collaborative with uh, Republican legislators and leaders, where we were successful and we proved that we can uh, overcome that and divide. The education bill of 2011, where again, with the support of the public majority and the legislature, we increased funding for K 12 education, which uh, has been cut with real dollars. Uh, successfully before them and uh, put in teacher evaluation, principal evaluation, some other necessary reforms. So we are at some instances where we showed that we can rise above the partisanship and the politics and, and do what we can agree is the best of the state. We have our honest differences. We have our honest uh, different opinions of what uh, is best for Minnesota and what's better for one part of the state than another is also going to be different. But, but uh, we need to do a better job of that, and I'll still continue to do my best to bring that about. But it takes, you can't dance by yourself. It kind of takes the uh, willingness on, on both sides for all sides. All right, the next question um, starts off with something that uh, Jeff Johnson just said to us a few moments ago. And this questioner asks, Jeff Johnson said that the problem of job creation was no different in rural Minnesota than metro Minnesota. Do you agree? And what are your ideas for job creation in extreme rural parts of our state? Well, I, I think job creation challenge is different from one part of the state and other, different from one part of greater Minnesota from another because of the differences in our economy. Northeastern Minnesota, you've got a mining based economy, and in our western, you know, in central Minnesota, you've got the, the wood products, you've got the tourism, you get out the uh, Western Minnesota and down in the North Dakota, South Dakota, and Iowa border. You've got uh, agriculture as the dominant industry, and, and that's a different set of issues and concerns. And then, of course, in the metropolitan area, you've got a, more, a diverse economy, and, and you have manufacturing, which unfortunately is 
coming back to all over the state. You know, the economic growth uh, we've seen is not limited to the metropolitan areas. In Rochester, it's on a one way to 3.9%. In Vito, it's down to 3.7%. Now it's a little over 4%. Uh, you know, it doesn't mean that we've seen that kind of improvement everywhere. But if you go down to Jackson County with ECHO and the expansion there and others, and they don't, can't uh, attract the jobs they need to help them her own with the Daryl Fund, the, 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 the company, they're importing uh, workers from Ukraine and housing them in the Staples in order to fill the needs there. So we had more situations in Laverne, Marshall, and Laverne, and really then Marshall was directly affected. Lewis and Clark Water Pipeline was just crucial to be allowing businesses there that wanted to locate and expand to go ahead and do so. So, you know, it really is, in the, you know, Dave Ferguson says, you know, farmers don't farm in the aggregate, they farm individuals. All towns, uh, cities, you know, counties have individual situations that have common, common threads and common concerns. But it really, that's why I think you have an experience working statewide. I've been probably around the state for 39 years now, and I know it pretty well, and of course it's always changing. But you really do need to recognize the different needs in different areas. The next question is, uh People who are in civil commitment and uh, at, this, at this point have, have had no, virtually no possibility of being uh, released provisionally or otherwise uh, overnight. It's been an accumulation of, of a number of years, a number of administrations. It's not, it's not partisan, political, it is political. It's political because if you ask the people in Minnesota, you know, do you think somebody who is a repeat uh, sex offender should be? kept uh, removed from the rest of our society for the rest of their lives, or do you think they should be released provisionally or released into the general population? I think you'd find overwhelming many people would say, keep them separate. And so what evolved in the state 30 years ago, which is after prison sentences were completed, in indeterminate sentencing and civil procedures for a definite period of time, and then keeping those individuals uh, safeguarded St. Peter or Moose Lake that has generally served, the, I think, the, probably the, pub, the public's desire for that kind of uh, absolute protection. It, have, it may be for when the uh, state attorney general is arguing that it is constitutional, the plaintiffs are arguing otherwise, and the federal judge will make that decision. So, absent the absolute requirement that there uh, be changes made because it's unconstitutional and, and according to the federal. Constitution. Uh, there, there are more reasons to keep things as they are than there are to change them. And every change is expensive, every change creates uncertainty. And as we learned in the first uh, couple of instances, any change becomes uh, blown up and then does become politicized and bandied around by people who, whatever reasons, uh, and there's nobody in that program who doesn't have a reason for being there. And so I, I will offer the last. Paul, uh, I met with the former Chief Justice Eric Magnuson in addition to attending the Governor's uh, Fishing Open with him and fishing together at Midland for the last uh, couple of years. We worked together on this and he showed tremendous leadership and some legislators like him were more and some real leadership and, and as a result the Senate did pass in 2013 uh, some legislation and the House has just absolutely refused. I mean, to be honest, in the support where it lies, I can be meeting starting last November with the four leaders of uh, the four caucuses and the chairs of the uh, ranking members of those committees and said, let's work something out together. It's going to have to be all of us. We're not going to you know, let you do something that's going to allow somebody to be targeted or something on one side to be targeted. But we're all in this together, so let's work out. It just was not, it was not accepted by the House Republican Caucus, they didn't, wouldn't participate. We had several other meetings that made up the session. So I'm, I stand ready to do it, but again, you can't dance by yourself. 
and in this case, uh, it probably will require the federal judge pushing Minnesota or requiring Minnesota to make changes to get approval for the kind of expenditures, additional staffing, additional safety precautions, and, and just the general di disruption to the current situation. Uh, a couple of successes of things that you're proud of from your first term, such as restoring some of the cuts to county program aid and uh, certainly restoring the school shift. As you work on preparing your budget for 2015, there are still a number of other county programs that haven't made it back to full funding. For example, a local public health block grant, a number of health and human services block grant programs. How are you thinking about looking at restoration of funds as you put your budget together uh, versus moving forward in new areas and new ideas? One, one, one underlying factor here that the public doesn't really understand, and I don't all due respect the press doesn't always support this imagine to uh, reflect it accurately is, is the increase, so called increases in spending that, that have occurred in the last uh, couple of years are in most cases the reverse of cuts, sometimes very serious cuts in funding that preceded uh, in, in the, the previous decade. Um, in fiscal 2012, state support for higher education for the ministry campuses, University of Minnesota, and student aid was a real dollar, that population dollar was the lowest it had been since 1981. So we increased state funding for higher education, it shows in the state the budget $240 million, and that was a spending increase. But that only brought us back to the level that it had been four years before, it had been in real dollars. So you talk about restoring previous cuts, but people's memories are short, people don't realize that there were those cuts, and so everything is seen as a spending increase when in fact it's just starting to get back to uh, kind of balance that uh, existed before. My, my, my goal is if uh, the state's economy continues to improve, and I have a certain reason to believe it will, that uh, we'll have the resources available and now we straighten out the budget. We've repaid the school debt $28 billion. We've restored now all these other funds that were rated for various uh, budget short-term remedies that have just, uh, you know, really affected the fiscal integrity of the state as well as our ability now to move forward. We had a clean slate now. We had a clean slate in 2013 we had been facing a projected deficit for the next biennium and with the school still 2.8 billion. We would have been needed to raise anybody's taxes. And we're still going to make the investments in education, county program, both company and property tax relief and like we thought were essential to make. So we're not even yet back to uh, uh, even the starting point. We're getting close to that. But as we do, and, and as we move ahead, I think we'll have an opportunity to decide where the priorities, we'll have the resources to do everything. That's the nature of the process. We'll have an opportunity to work with you and decide what are the priorities, what needs to be expanded. What is your proudest achievement for your first term? I think we made really extraordinary strides forward in, in education, especially K 12 education. Uh, starting actually with, even before that with early childhood education, which was had no funding at the state level when I arrived, and, and now, and, and that again has been very much bipartisan. The Minnesota Business Partnership championed this, and we got started with the Republican leadership in the legislature, continued to expand it in the PFL leadership. Uh, but that's crucial. Let me talk about the achievement gap and how we close that. The experts that I read or listen to say that uh, our best strategy is to start earlier and earlier and reach out to you know, kids with disadvantaged backgrounds and give them the tools that they need so that the gap doesn't begin and, and doesn't widen. All day kindergarten. Uh, we, I proposed that in 2009 and proposed again in 2010. Spring didn't get passed in 2011 or 12. Did get passed in 2013 and just started this week or last week. For, and uh, you know that's going to make a phenomenal difference for the children and also for the parents. And, and also relieving some of the financial costs for parents who hear it for either have to pay money to give their kids a kindergarten education or were paying money uh, for child care because of the because through the, the kindergarten classes. And the increase of curriculum aid formula has gone up about 12%. And that money is, like the money for you, is, is, is un uncertain. And that, that's, I think, in many respects, like CPA and LGA, the most 
essential part of the state participation with local governments is you get the money and you decide what your priorities are, you decide what needs to be done, it's going to be different from one county to another than it should be. I want to go back to something you mentioned about environmental permitting and streamlining of that work. Um, as you know, there's still a lot of regulations related to land use policy in Minnesota, whether it's water drainage or a variety of things. What more can be done, or what's your vision for continuing to work on regulation streamlining, both for um, private landowners and for county projects? Well, I proposed in the um, session this last spring that we uh, revised significantly the environmental uh, permitting process and sort of the EIS and the EAWs required, the length of time it takes to, to, to conduct those EIS to non common out takes 18 months and twice as what it took 30 years ago. EAWs now about nine months again, more than double the time it used to take. So the, the length of time it takes to go through this process uh, becomes very, very problematic for those who want to take the initiative and it's also just drives it out so that we can't, you know, can't make decisions and, and move ahead. So that's be a key area where I would like to go back again. The, the administrative rulemaking is also something the legislature would prefer uh, the client to, to take on and those are more controversial areas, but they're also much more substantive than and need to be done. Um, you know, land use issues, I'm sure you know from your experience, land use issues, resource use issues are in many respects, the most difficult to resolve because everybody on one side thinks that they are absolutely in the right, and the other side is absolutely in the wrong, and vice versa. And you know, we introduce um, all the other uh, pejoratives into it, and, and people's interests are different, people's economic interests. I just use up the more as part of the diversion project, and if you're in Wilkin County uh, and you're a fifth generation farmer and, and that land is going to be, which has never been flooded before, is going to be flooded regularly. Uh, if you're dead setting against the project for a very understandable reason. If you're more in or in South Fargo in terms of uh, development opportunities, uh, your interests are to, to go ahead and do the project as rapidly as possible. So we're going to have decision just to be made. I mean, I, I think in most cases it really is a local level. It's a, a, at the county level, at the you know, watershed district level, it's, it's exactly by people who are closest to the situation who can take the time to understand the details of the situation and really to understand who they're going to be living with or next to the people who are going to be affected by those decisions. And a, a broad state policy, as we've seen again and again, whether it's high shore development or whatever else, I mean, it just falls apart as soon as you start applying it to a particular city or a particular county or a particular lake you know, versus somewhere else. And so, you know, we can set some broad parameters, but I think the best decision making is local. And on that note, Governor, one last question for you. I have to take the opportunity to ask you about what has been one of the county's top priorities over the last few legislative sessions, the Magic Act, which will allow us more flexibility for that local decision making you just talked about. If re-elected, can we count on your support the Magic Act? Well, I, don't, I can't say absolutely every, every detail of the spirit of it, which is to you know, take off some of the restrictions and the, the micromanaging is something I strongly support. And, and if I could wave a magic wand, I would make one jurisdiction of government responsible for every, every land use, resource use decision and eliminate the duplication, triplication, multiplication of oversight um, the federal government, state government, um, on, on top of all of the local government entities. I mean, it's just everybody looks at it from their own piece and says, okay, it's important that we have a, a voice in this decision. But nobody looks at the cumulative effect of the sum total of all of those requirements. And, and we deal with uh, my endless frustration with the EPA. Um, and, you know, I, I say, you know, we have it. What they say is the best uh, MBCA in the country, so why are they second guessing and overriding all these decisions on a fairly routine matter? Um, they don't trust us and do it themselves and you know, pay for it and everything else. And the same with, uh, with your decision as well. So, but getting into the de details there and, and trying to unravel all those uh, interconnections is, is a challenge, but it's, it's one we really all need to work together on. But yes, that's definitely support the spirit and intent of the ministry.
Thank you, Governor. And with that, we will all join in thanking.